Thank you very much, Professor Santuri. You're hearing me okay? It feels like it's picking it up. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, under the auspices of the Institute for Freedom and Community, which you can see uh, behind me uh, there. Um, uh, the, the, the programming for the Institute is actually uh, uh, quite imaginative and, uh, and impressive, and I'm, I'm honored to have a, a place in that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's good to be here and see what the Institute is doing. I want to say just one word before I launch into this uh, talk, because once I launch into it, I'll sort of stay uh, launched. Um, uh, and that is that if you, uh, if you spend time thinking about various moral problems, different kinds of moral problems, and I've taught that sort of stuff for a long time, uh, I think you'll find that on, on certain problems, you will, you, will, you will find that your thinking is pretty clear. That you're, pretty satisfied with the conclusions you reach. doesn't mean that you think everybody else will necessarily agree. It'd be nice if they did, but the doesn't, world doesn't work that way. Um, but you yourself will be uh, clear. And there will be other questions on which, though you, you, you develop a view, you have a view about uh, the matter, you'll continue to find it puzzling in some ways um, and, and uh, a little less clear uh, to you. That's the sort of topic this is tonight, at least uh, in my view, uh, for me. And um, I want to try to puzzle it through with you a little bit. I do have to warn you that it will take a while for me to actually get to the topic of sedation. There are going to be some preliminary matters before I get there, but um, they're good preliminary matters, and you just have to be, uh, be patient. I take as my starting point the following simple thesis. This is a quotation. Relief of suffering stands next to health as a crucial part of the medical goal, and medicine has always sought to comfort where it cannot heal. That sentence was first written by a man named Leon Cass, very well-known figure in the world of medical ethics. And I use it precisely because Cass is well known as a critic of expansive notions of the goals of medicine, as if medicine should just deal with well-being in all sorts of different ways. Uh, Cass is disinclined to approve goals that stray too far from service to the good of health. That's what medicine deals with, is the good of health, in his view. And, of course, Cass has also written in opposition to the idea that physicians should, even from merciful motives, act with the purpose of ending a patient's life. He had a famous essay on why doctors should not kill. So evidently, Cass thinks that these two positions, that the, the, the goals of medicine should be rather narrowly defined and related to the good, the good of health, and that uh, physicians should not engage in mercy killing, he evidently thinks that those two positions are quite compatible with the sentence I take as my thesis. Relief of suffering stands next to health as a crucial part of the medical goal, and medicine has always sought to comfort where it cannot heal. Now, I agree with him. I think that those other positions, th those views are compatible with this, but it's going to take some work uh, to get uh, to there. And before I begin to talk about palliative sedation, um, I want to um, uh, uh, think about two preliminary issues that it seems to me we, we have to make up our mind about before they, they will frame our thinking on this question and we need to think about them uh, first. For one thing, we, we simply need to have a view on the, take a position on the matter of euthanasia. Is it permissible or not? After all, if there is no reason to draw back from the practice of euthanasia, then there will be fewer cases in which we will even need to consider palliative sedation. Instead, we would simply proceed to end the suffering by dispatching the sufferer. Uh, the other question that needs attention is the meaning and usefulness of what gets called double effect reasoning. I don't know whether that term uh, uh, means anything to you at the moment or not. I'm going to try to make it mean something. We'll see. You'll have to decide whether uh, I succeed in that. But at any rate, with respect to the second issue, if palliative sedation can reasonably be, reasonably be construed only as aiming at the patient's death, as intending uh, the patient's death, then it will in effect be euthanasia. And again, there will be very little reason to draw back from just frankly acknowledging that fact. So I want to take up these two preliminary questions first at, at some length. Obviously, we can't here say everything that needs to be said about euthanasia, um, a topic that, uh, uh, about which uh, a great deal uh, has been written. I simply want to note 
briefly four considerations that seem to me to be important to keep in mind when we ask ourselves whether euthanasia can ever be permissible. First, very simple point. Physicians are obligated to do what they can to relieve the suffering of their patients. But this means, I think, what they morally can. It doesn't just mean anything. Physicians are not obligated to succeed. There's not, uh, you know, uh, medicine is hard enough uh, without that obligation. There can, there can really be no discussion of these matters if we do not acknowledge the fact uh, from the outset that there may be things that physicians should not do even in order to relieve suffering. We at least have to acknowledge that possibility. We cannot oppose medical hubris in other ways while ignoring it in these difficult circumstances. The physician is still always a limited moral agent, and moral reflection should always keep open the possibility of limits on what may be done by physicians even in the very best of causes. Second, it cannot be emphasized too often that refusing to approve actions that intend even for merciful motives the death of a suffering person does not at all mean that we must do everything possible in order to keep that person alive. We should always choose life, not death, but the life we choose need not be the longest one available from among the possible options. If, if, that were, if, if we always had to choose the longest life available, I always uh, say we'd have to have a world in which there were no soldiers and a lot of librarians. Apologies to uh, librarians, um, uh, but it doesn't seem as dangerous an occupation as uh, uh, being a soldier. So refusing or withdrawing life-prolonging treatment when it is either useless or excessively burdensome has been considered good medicine for centuries. So one may rightly choose a life, choose a life that is free of burdensome treatments, even if that life is somewhat shorter than might be possible. And because that's the case, de death need not always be opposed. Refusing to kill does not mean doing everything within our power to extend life. So we should choose life, but sometimes what that will mean is choosing how to live while dying. Third, what you might ask about the freedom to order one's own life, a freedom that we in our culture are uh, very much in love with. Um, we make countless decisions that shape the course our life takes, and we might ask why should others have the right to deprive us of the freedom to call a halt if we think the time has come to do so. Powerful as that sort of question is within our culture, we need to remind ourselves first that it is overstated by a good bit. There are many things, ranging from marrying one's sister to using certain drugs to selling a kidney for profit, that even our individualistic society will not allow any of us to do. Moreover, and maybe more important, we are never quite the independent individuals that we like to suppose we are. In class discussion many years ago, one of my students talking about a cousin of hers who had committed suicide and the effect it had on his family said, he didn't just take his own life, he took part of theirs as well. When class was over, I went right back to my office. I wrote that down in my notes for the day. I've been quoting her ever since. Talia Reisman was her name. I have no idea where Talia is uh, today, but I keep giving her credit uh, time after time for that. She articulated a deep sociological truth there for our lives are connected to others from the very start. At the deepest level, however, this truth, I think, is theological and not just sociological. Created by God for community with one another, created to know ourselves as finite beings for whom freedom becomes destructive if it acknowledges no limits, we deceive ourselves if we suppose that our lives are simply ours to do with as we please. And this also means, then, finally, a fourth point, it means that genuine compassion for those who suffer must respect the boundary established by the fact that we are all equals, all equidistant from God. Our equality is grounded in the fact that we have not made each other. None of us is a life giver. Hence, we cannot give ultimate authority over our life to another human being, nor are we authorized to exercise such authority over the life of another. Therefore, compassion is not a formless emotion, free to be shaped in any way we please. Compassion does not move us to engineer another's death, but to face it together. 
The most basic questions about the worth and meaning of human life are not medicines to answer. All physicians can do, though it is a great deal, is to keep company with the dying when they confront, as each of us must, the question of the meaning and the point of the life we share. So this establishes a boundary, no to euthanasia, that should govern our thinking. And that means that if it turns out that palliative sedation is just euthanasia by sleight of hand, then it will not be acceptable. If, on the other hand, it is relief of suffering grounded in the truth that we are not obligated to do everything within our power to prolong life, then it may be permissible or maybe even desirable. But in order to reflect upon what we are really doing when we practice such sedation, we need to take up a second preliminary question, the, the nature of what I called double effect moral reasoning. At the heart of the concept of double effect is a distinction between what we do and what is accomplished by our doing. Most of the time, even though we may have a very particular aim in action, that action is likely to have several results, some good and some evil. And quite often we may foresee that what we do is likely to result not only in the good at which we aim and desire, but also in evils that we do not intend and would regret. It's just the nature of action that that's often the case. So for example, to take a, a very homely uh, illustration of this first, but maybe one that will hit home for some in my audience, I give a student a poor grade because that in fact is what his work merits and he deserves an honest assessment of, it, of his work. I may of course hope that this will be a uh, chastening experience for him, moving him to produce more diligent and careful work in the future, but whether that happens or not, he will have a truthful mirror in which to see clearly the quality of his work. And yet, knowing the student as I do, I may foresee that a poor grade is at least as likely to depress and dispirit him, making it even more difficult for him to produce good work and contributing to a state of mind that may have long-term harmful effects on his life. Still, I am a teacher, he is my student, I owe him an honest assessment and I owe fairness to the other students whose work has been superior to his. So I intend to provide him with an accurate appraisal of his work, though I foresee the possible, perhaps even likely, ill effects that may result. If I am morally culpable not only for what I do, what I aim at or intend, but also for everything that I foresee resulting from what I do, then my hands may be tied. I must give him a passing grade, perhaps even a pretty good passing grade, lest the foreseen evil effects come about. And it's that concept of foreseen but unintended result that is at the heart of double effect reasoning, and I do not think we can really get along without it in our moral thinking. Without it, a military leader cannot be justified in sending soldiers under his command out as a decoy, knowing what's going to happen to the soldiers who are performing that decoy function. Without it, a doctor cannot justifiably give a suffering patient increasing doses of a narcotic drug that may have the effect of depressing respiration and result in a somewhat hastened death. Indeed, anyone who is able and willing to threaten foreseeable, sufficiently evil results will be in a position to obligate us to, obligate us to act in whatever way he requires. Realizing this, we might even say that distinguishing what we do from the foreseeable results of our action is necessary if we are to be free from moral coercion. This is not just a point about moral reasoning, though, at least I don't think so. It is a point about what it means to be creatures whose love and care for others must always be love and care within limits. From a purely impersonal standpoint, just thinking of sort of uh, events in the world. From a purely impersonal standpoint, what we do, our actions, might be regarded just as events taking place in the world. But as moral agents, that is, as creatures who are made for communion in love with God and creatures whose character is shaped in action, we can never so regard our actions. Those actions are not simply events in the world. They are occasions in which, so to speak, we come upon ourselves. We learn in part who we are, what sort of person we are, who we're willing 
to be. They indicate whether we will trust God to care for us and for the world he has made, or whether we think we must shoulder that burden ourselves. So to aim at evil, even in a good cause, is to take into our person a choice against what is good. Not just to let evil happen as a kind of event in the world, but to give it the personal involvement of our purpose. Put in Christian terms, it is, be it is to begin to make of ourselves people who would not really want to be with God. Thinking in terms of double effect, recognizing that what we do is determined by our aim or purpose, not by everything that results from our doing, makes possible a distinction between evil that is simply a byproduct of setting out to seek the good and evil with which we invest the personal involvement of our own purpose. Now to be sure, it is quite possible to play games with the language of double effect. There are lots of famous examples of this in, uh, in the moral literature. But if we do play the games with it, it will only foster skepticism about the worth of moral reasoning more generally. For example, to give you an instance in which I think we might play a game with a language that just doesn't work, imagine a soldier in combat who fires at an approaching enemy soldier and kills him. Now, if we suppose that it is always wrong to aim to kill, but if we also want to defend the soldier's action, we might be tempted, as some people have, to say that he aimed only to incapacitate the oncoming enemy, foreseeing but not intending his death. That, I fear, is a sort of argumentative move that probably isn't going to ring true to the soldier uh, while he's doing it, and that is likely to make skeptics of those who hear it. Or to take another example uh, from warfare, an area of life which, alas, is all too rich uh, in such examples. Pilots might bomb a munition supply depot, knowing full well that some civilians in the area are likely to be injured or killed, even as the military target uh, is bombed. That is simply the sad reality of war. And I think you can justify it using double effect reasoning, distinguishing between foreseen and uh, uh, unintended consequences. But if we know that a hospital and a school, say, are fairly close to the munitions depot, and if we ourselves make no effort whatsoever to narrow our target as much as possible, nor ask our pilots to take risks in order to achieve that narrowing, then it's hard for us to claim that we intended to target only the munitions foreseeing but not intending harm to those in the hospital or the school. Examples such as these make clear that what we aim at or intend is not just something inside us, is not just what we want or desire, what moves us to act. It is therefore, I think, incorrect to write as two physicians writing about these issues do when they say, double effect apparently focuses on how physicians state their intentions rather than on what they do. It seems to imply that physicians are more justified in administering large doses of opioids if they can put out of mind the possibility that death may be hastened. I don't think that's what this reasoning is getting at. On the contrary, the concept of intention must be distinguished from the concept of motive. Intention cover governs what we do the structure of our action, and we cannot make an action mean just anything that we happen to want or desire. Now to be sure, sometimes we may be uncertain how to make these distinctions. We may just find ourselves puzzled. Nothing wrong with that. The moral life is puzzling uh, sometimes. We may not know how to sort out the complications that thinking in these terms requires of us. That's one reason why moral judgments are not always easily transferable to a court of law. But in fact, just because some of these cases are hard cases does not mean that we should not try to draw the distinctions as best we can. Refusing to think in terms of double effect it may seem to simplify matters, but it will turn out to be a simplicity that misses a lot of moral importance. All that can or should be asked of us is honesty, that we not try to play games with the moral language. So then, in terms of these preliminary matters, Yes, to double effect reasoning, it is both right and necessary to distinguish between our aim when acting and the results of that action. No to euthanasia. And so these, uh, with those two answers to those preliminary questions will frame my thinking about the issue of palliative or terminal sedation, to which you may be glad to know I now intend finally 
to turn. Palliative sedation may be considered not only for patients who are in the very last stages of their dying, but also for patients who, though suffering greatly, could live a reasonable amount longer. For the moment, though, here at the start, in order to just keep things a little more manageable, I am going to restrict my attention solely to patients whose physical and related emotional suffering is severe, whose pain has thus far not been effectively relieved, it's just unconquerable, and whose death is imminent, a matter of hours or days. I want to start with that kind of case. A physician might approach caring for such a patient in two ways that may seem rather similar and are in some ways, but also are different in an important way. On the one hand, a physician could gradually increase dosages of pain medications, hoping to find a point at which the patient is able to tolerate uh, his pain, while of course the physician would foresee that in doing this, it's possible that these increasing dosages might decrease the patient's level of consciousness and might somewhat shorten life by suppressing respiration. This would be almost classically an instance of double effect reasoning, aiming at the good effect of relieving the distressing symptoms while foreseeing and allowing the possible evil effects of shortened life and diminished consciousness. And something like that, I assume, is what physicians, good physicians who are opposed to palliative sedation would do in caring for their patients. They would not sedate them to unconsciousness, but they would, you know, gradually increase the uh, dosages of the pain medication, doing their best to, uh, to make the pain tolerable while foreseeing the possibility that doing this might uh, shorten life somewhat. But that would be a foreseen but unintended result. That's one way a physician might approach uh, such a patient. On the other hand, a physician could use a barbiturate drip intended to render the patient unconsciousness, un unconscious, thereby eliminating the patient's experience of suffering during the last hours or days of life. This approach differs from the first in that this second physician takes aim not at the physical symptoms that are producing the pain and the suffering, but at the conscious experience of suffering itself. Now, if you ask yourself, can we use double effect reasoning to justify this, that's where the issue is going to become important. I, in fact, think we can, but um, uh, there are people in the world who don't agree uh, with me about that. Um, we might try to use the language of the double effect, though. We could say, for example, the physician's action aims at the good effect of rendering the patient unconscious and hence free of experienced suffering while foreseeing and allowing the evil effect of a possibly shortened life. And the question is whether that's a, uh, an acceptable formulation. Okay, I'm going to try to suggest that it is, um, but there are you know, smart people who, uh, who don't agree. That possible formulation forces us to think about a significant difference between those two kinds of physicians' approaches that I sketched. And the crucial issue is, may we properly describe unconsciousness as a good for this patient or for any human being? May we properly describe an intention to render a patient unconscious as, in these difficult circumstances, good medical practice? Or must we say that that second physician aims at an evil effect, namely unconsciousness, as a means to achieving the good effect of relieving suffering, and hence sort of deliberately does evil? The language of double effect will work for this second approach only if sometimes unconsciousness is not an evil, but a good at which it is permissible to aim. And that, in fact, is the position that I want to defend. We can, of course, understand why someone might hold that it is always wrong for a physician deliberately to induce unconsciousness in a patient. Physicians, we might say, serve the good of health. Remember that sort of commitment to a limited understanding of the medical task? Physicians serve the good of health. Consciousness is an important aspect of what we generally mean by health. Hence, although physicians may sometimes render a patient tempor temporarily unconscious, say while performing surgery, that is always part of a procedure whose overall goal is bettering or restoring the patient's health, including the patient's conscious health. In no way does it express an intention to turn against the good of consciousness, an intention that, you know, on the view of some people, would, should have no place in good medical practice. This is, as I said, a serious argument. I take it seriously. 
but I myself do not find it persuasive. Granting, of course, that different patients may value differently continuing conscious experience. We, you know, we, we, may we may differ somewhat in that way. Consciousness seems to me, if I may put it just a little too brashly, not quite that big a deal. Imagine, for example, that you have been for years an insulin-dependent di diabetic, and you are now irretrievably dying from an incurable cancer only days from death. May you, having said your prayers and your goodbyes, stop taking insulin and drift off into a diabetic coma. Or are you obligated to remain conscious for those last days while suffering the effects of your cancer? I cannot see that there is any obligation to continue the insulin, any obligation to remain conscious in such circumstances. Even if we die while unconscious, we can be confident that God will know us by name. And in doing without the insulin, such a person would not be choosing death, not aiming at death. He would simply be choosing how to live, namely unconsciously, while dying. I was not conscious at the start of my life in the womb, was barely conscious after birth, and wholly apart from anything doctors do, may not be conscious at life's end. That is to say, life has a trajectory of development that takes us from rudimentary beginnings to what we like to think of as optimal capacities, to diminished capacities, and to the loss of many or most capacities, including perhaps consciousness at the end. To the degree that consciousness is a good, it is so only in terms of that pattern of development. As I would not ordinarily try to suppress consciousness in a healthy 35-year-old, so I would not ordinarily be bothered by its absence in a fetus or feel any need to foster or extend its expression in a 95-year-old who has said his goodbyes. That is to say, I think about consciousness rather in the way I think about our procreative powers. Each is a part of good health, a part of the good physicians serve, but each has a limited place in the overall trajectory of a life. Physicians serve the good of health, to be sure, but not only health. Relief of suffering is also one of the goals of medicine, and physicians must seek to comfort even when they cannot heal. Now remember, by hypothesis, for the moment, we are considering a patient whose death is imminent, a matter of hours or days, whose suffering is terrible, and for whom even considerable doses of medication to relieve pain symptoms have been unsuccessful. Remembering that one of the goals of medicine is relief of suffering, I think that sedation to unconsciousness for such a patient, even if rarely needed, can be good medical practice. In such straitened circumstances, there is no need for and little to be gained from attempting to distinguish an intention to palliate symptoms with the foreseen effect of unconsciousness from a simple intention to produce unconsciousness. Just as we strain moral reasoning beyond its limits, if we think of the soldier who fires at an enemy as aiming only to incapacitate rather than to kill, so also here we should simply acknowledge that in rare circumstances we rightly intend to produce unconsciousness in a patient. No doubt, as I have said, such cases will be relatively rare. But subject, of course, to correction by those with more medical training and experience than I, which means any medical training and experience, I think there are such cases, and I want to give you one example that just seems to me to be indubitable. In his book, Dying Well, uh, a physician, Ira Bayak, who's a well-known hospice physician and is a critic of proposals for euthanasia, tells the story of a woman named Terry Matthews, who was his patient near the very end of her life. She was suffering terribly from an advanced kidney cancer, was in the end being given dosages of 900 milligrams of morphine per hour, which is an astonishing amount, and yet remained in unconquerable pain as she struggled to remain alive for her husband and children. She didn't want to die. She, she worked hard to stay alive. But finally, when she could bear it no longer, Dr. Bayak gave her a barbiturate drip that would, as he writes, put her into a deep, painless sleep in which sleep she could die peacefully. In recounting the case, he says that he told her, I can give you a sedative that will make you drowsy and then put you into what we might call a twilight sleep. She asks him whether she will wake up sometimes and find herself again in this terrible pain. 
No, Terry, he replies, not if you don't want to. And then having expressed to the very end her love for her husband and children, she finally accepted the sedation and died a little more than a day later, having never regained consciousness. I cannot describe this as bad medical practice, and hence it seems to me to be a case in which intending to sedate to unconsciousness is good and morally appropriate medical care. Perhaps, I, I cannot say, perhaps some other patient could have tolerated the pain Terry Matthews endured, though given Dr. Byock's description, I find that a little hard to believe. But we need only one such case to remind us of my thesis that relief of suffering stands next to health as a crucial part of the medical goal, and medicine has always sought to comfort where it cannot heal. I conclude, therefore, that it cannot always be morally wrong to turn against the good of consciousness. Not always. But remember, the previous discussion was confined very specifically to instances of patients whose physical and related emotional suffering is severe, really just unable to be, be relieved by any ordinary sedation, whose suffering has thus far not been effectively relieved, and whose death is imminent, a matter of hours or days. There are certainly harder cases. For example, cases of those who, despite suffering terribly, may still live for some time, or those whose suffering is, for the most part, emotional rather than physical, suffering that these days gets called existential. These sorts of cases need more particular attention. And so I want to kind of think with you and puzzle through with you a series of three possible cases that are, uh, you know, are the more complicated ones, not of someone who's going to die very, very soon in any case. So first then, suppose a 75-year-old man, which actually isn't very old, uh, I have to tell you. Um, Professor Santuri knows that it's not that old. <laughs> Suppose a 75-year-old man who underwent surgery for colon cancer five years ago and who has now entered the hospital with symptoms of severe abdominal pain and vomiting. Tests show that his bowel is obstructed and that his cancer has returned and spread into both abdomen and bones. He has at most perhaps a month or two to live and his, his physicians treat him with high doses, very high doses of nar narcotic drugs to ease his pain. Unfortunately, the side effects of those drugs, constant muscle twitching, just sort of uncontrollable muscle twitching and nausea, are almost impossible for him to tolerate. After a week of this treatment in the hospital and with the bowel obstruction exacerbated rather than resolved, he finds himself at the end of his tether and he asks to be sedated for the rest of his life. Since in his case, because of the bowel obstruction, um, it, it would make very little sense to pump nutrients into his body. He would not be given artificial nutrition and hydration if sedated to unconsciousness. Very possibly then he may die somewhat sooner than if he were not sedated, although of course since severe pain can also shorten life, we cannot be certain of that. And in the nature of the case, you can't run a controlled experiment to see um, uh, which shortens life more. This is a harder case than that of Terry Matthews, or at least I think it is. It may be less clear that this man's pain is intolerable, though it is certainly very bad, and his death, though not that far off, is not exactly imminent either. Still, even if not every person in his condition would make the request that he does, I do not think he does wrong in asking to be sedated. I think it is permissible for him to choose to live this way, unconsciously, to live that way while dying nor do I think his physicians do wrong if they comply with his request. But it is important to be clear about what we're saying when we say this and why we might say it. In its 2014 position statement on palliative sedation, the Board of Directors of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine defended the use in what they called extreme situations of sedation to unconsciousness, but only, this is the quote, only if its use is not expected to shorten the patient's time to death. Well, I don't think that formulation is, is satisfactory because it may shorten the time to death uh, sometimes. In the case I have described here, the patient's time to death could possibly be shortened if he were continuously sedated um, uh, because in his case, uh, there's going to be no point in providing continued nourishment of any sort. Maybe that will shorten his life. But that would be, in the language of double effect, a foreseen but unintended effect, 
of an action properly aimed, or so it seems to me, at relieving suffering that the patient was unable to tolerate despite the best care short of sedation. He is going to die fairly soon in any case, and I cannot see that physicians are obligated to see that he remains conscious until the very end. That's the way he has to die. Assuming they have done their best and failed to provide tolerable relief of his symptoms by means short of sedation, I think they could rightly comply with his request. Then take a second case. Imagine a patient with a relatively advanced case of ALS, still able to breathe without constant support of a ventilator, but no longer able to stand, to walk, or to use his, his arms and hands effectively. He remains able to chew food and, his, and, and, and eats, but he has on a number of occasions choked while eating, an experience that is, of course, terrifying. Clearly, at some future time, whose nearness is difficult to predict, his disease will progress to the point where, without permanent respiratory support, he will be unable to breathe and will die. But that is still some time in the indefinite future. He is, however, terrified by what the future holds, and he asks to be sedated until he dies. Notice that although this patient's debilitating physical condition is the source of much of his suffering, those physical symptoms in themselves are not the reason he requests sedation. He is asking for relief from feelings of fear, terror, and perhaps a sense of recoil from his physical inabilities and dependence. Complicating his case is that he may still have some time to live. If we sedate him to unconsciousness and do not provide him with nutrition and hydration, he will almost surely die sooner than he would otherwise. Doing that begins to look a little more like choosing death than simply choosing how to live while dying. Of course, if we were to sedate him and simultaneously tube feed him, that would be a different matter. Then relief of suffering, not death, would clearly be our aim. Hence, the patient must ask himself what it is, in fact, that he intends and what it is that he want his, wants his physicians to help him do. Is he choosing death, aiming at, his, at death as his desired end, or is he simply choosing one from among the several possible life choices that are still available to him? And physicians must ask themselves what they are doing. For sedating him while providing nutrition is something different from sedating him while providing no nourishment. Physicians will have to ask themselves what constitutes good medical practice in such circumstances. Understandable as this patient's request is, after all, in similar circumstances, I would be just as terrified. It is hard to think of sedation without nutrition in this instance as a choice of life, not death and we should think twice before distorting our moral language to make it seem otherwise. Rather than turning to sedation in such a case, perhaps physicians should seek for the patient forms of spiritual and psychological care that can directly address the fear and desperation he is experiencing, and in that way keep company with him in the midst of his suffering. To be sure, such care may or may not help the patient deal with his fears, but as I said earlier, physicians and other, care, and other caregivers are not obligated to succeed. They are only obligated to do the very best they can. And then third, third case. Permanent sedation is even more problematic for patients whose suffering is, so far as we can tell, a result not of an underlying physical pathology, but a product of beliefs that they hold about their life. For example, they may think their life no longer has purpose or meaning. They may experience a deep sense of worthlessness or disgust with themselves. They may be deeply depressed by the loneliness and dependence of old age. It should not be impossible for us to understand and sympathize with them. But they are not dying. And hence, they cannot simply choose how to live while dying. You can only choose how to live while dying if you are, in fact, dying. In truth, Life is precisely what they do not want to choose. Life is what they want to turn against. Granting that there is no easy recipe for dealing with such, <clears throat> with such deep-seated existential distress, at the heart of our humanity is an affirmation of life, a sense that our psychic and spiritual well-being requires that with the help of others, we face our own fragility 
seeking personal and spiritual wholeness. Turning to sedation in these sorts of cases seems more like abandoning patients than keeping company with them. It would be hard to claim with a straight face that the shortened life of such patients is simply a foreseen and not also an intended consequence of sedation to unconsciousness. There is, of course, no end to such cases. But by thinking with you, puzzling with you about these few examples, I hope at least to have refined somewhat our approach to them and encouraged you to puzzle over them as well. I take what I have done as attempting to illustrate what physicians have always known, that they should never aim to kill, but that relief of suffering stands alongside restoration of health as central to the goals of medicine, and that, and that physicians must try to comfort where they cannot heal. The vocation of the doctor is, as Paul Ramsey once put it, to cure sometimes, to relieve often, and to comfort always. Thank you very much.